dystopia and part utopia. Uh, today, I believe, we've got very deficient systems uh, for human beings uh, and for other entities in terms of how we manage identity and reputation uh, in our society. So that's what I'm going to talk about. And I'm going to try to run through a bunch of stuff that's kind of background first, uh, and then hopefully get to uh, a more interactive format where we can talk about ideas uh, for how we might improve on what we've already got. Uh, so, what's it all about? I just mentioned, we'll talk a little bit about the past, the present, uh, and at least some of my ideas about the future of how we're going to handle uh, reputation and identity uh, as something that we take into our own hands rather than allow large, hierarchical, impersonal, usually distant uh, organizations manage for us. So, what's it about? An identity, very simply, is just a, a means of mapping a name to, a, to an entity. Uh, my cat is named Charlie. Uh, as far as everybody knows, my cat is named Charlie. However, okay, now outside of this room and a few of my friends and some people who've seen cat pictures on the internet, um, not many people can identify Charlie as Charlie, the divisions. Uh, it's a means of verifying the individual yeah. mappings and then of, uh, coupling uh, individual qualifiers to a particular name. So, for example, Charlie has uh, a set of photos that look like these. Charlie was uh, <coughs> on, on this date. Charlie is a male. Uh, those kind of things more or less immutable uh, factors that go into uh, a bundle of qualifications for an identity. Or Homer is American, and Mark is American, and Homer. So reputation now is a collection of qualifiers again, but it's a collection of social qualifiers. Uh, the person who uh, is alone on an island uh, might still call himself Robinson. Uh, again, have a number of elements of identity that he attaches to himself, but without somebody else to uh, form a society with their uh, essentially reputation is a meaningless concept. So reputation only comes about in terms of society. Uh, and again, it's a means of verifying these qualifiers and qualifiers and of uh, adding, changing, and deleting uh, the qualifiers attached to an identity. So, I spent some time with uh, the GIMP, playing around with visions of dystopia in terms of identity, mostly because I couldn't come up with any good imagery for reputation. So, in the, uh, in the US, for example, you've got uh, fears that go back as long as I've been uh, on electronic communications networks back to the mid 80s on FIDONET and USENET of a national ID card going to be introduced as part of the Illuminati scheme to uh, dominate everyone and uh, make America a province of the United Nations or something like that. Uh, Gestapo papers uh, as verification of something or other. The uh, Film Minority Report uh, had a great scene where after getting new eyes, uh, Tom Cruise's character has to face an identity scan from his little spider robots. Uh, and he actually had to change, swap out his eyes uh, for somebody else's in order to get past uh, the system which wanted to capture him and ostensibly kill him. Uh, yes, we have our papers. And then down here at the bottom is one of my favorites in the Czech Republic. They've got a fun little local UFO cult called uh, the Svenjani, or the, the Outer Space People. And here it says, uh, Look out, uh, you and uh, they want to they want to put microchips uh, into your things. Uh, these are the uh, the reptilians uh, from hell. Uh, we want to put microchips into everything. Uh, so they use adopt some of the imagery from uh, Stop RFID, which I think started up in Germany, uh, and it's kind of a it's a neosyncretic uh, cult effectively. Uh, but they put these stickers up all over. Some more of the same, another one over here says so stop uh, microchip totalitarianism. Uh, here you've got the, uh, 
actually goes also to a reputation issue uh, from the film Demolition Man, where uh, Sylvester Stallone's character is woken up uh, from a long cryogenic prison sentence. And uh, what's that? <laughs> to the machine again, and, it says, and he says, the fuck, and you know, violation, another one. <laughs> because everything's being monitored, and it's just ready to spit out a, uh, a ticket with a fine. Uh, you know, everything to do with uh, uh, identity, in particular today, is just a mountain of paperwork. Um, you know, the idea that, uh, you know, the idea that a piece of plastic, uh, the presence or absence of a piece of plastic in someone's possession uh, is the difference in many cases between life and death is completely screwed up. Um, pretty much everything that uh, enters into the public sphere uh, with respect to what the state uh, and what, well, we'll call it the corporate state, wants you, your identity to be is being permanently databased. Uh, and as Wadhan said, uh, that data is not under your control. Uh, you don't have the ability to go in and modify something when it's wrong. You don't have the ability to go and, you know, roll back transactions. Uh, you've got to go through a mountain of paperwork even to do the simplest of things. Uh, and it's really just that the, the corporate state consents to your suggestion rather than executing a command uh, that you're entitled to execute. Of course, uh, 666, uh, the, uh, the ultimate thing from the book of Revelations in the Bible, uh, let him who has understanding reckon the number of the beast, 666, goes into all these uh, conspiracies again that I was reading about in the 80s. Uh, <coughs> who knows? <laughs> you know, it's certainly, it's certainly the case that in most of the economy today, uh, if you want to, uh, if you want to get uh, cash from a cash machine, if you want to get, uh, you know, if you want to manage money in any way other than all cash, uh, if you want to fly uh, in many places now, take a train or a bus, uh, you're going to have to show ID. Uh, if you want to start a business, you're going to have to show official ID, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's becoming such that uh, human beings who, you know, just a mere few thousand years ago were essentially born on this planet as smart monkeys. Uh, nobody looked around at each other and said, hey, you know, if you don't have a piece of paper or a piece of plastic, uh, you're a lesser form of being. Uh, but that's how it is today. That's not possible. Uh, this slide isn't really relevant, but when I was doing all the 666 stuff, I thought it would be fun to put in some stuff about the neighbors of the beast. <laughs> <laughs> 667 and 668 on the same street, obviously. <clears throat> so, I know it's dystopian shot time, but uh, okay, we, you know, we can talk about utopia too, right? What does it look like? Multi pass? <laughs> I don't know. The society in uh, the fifth element uh, doesn't look too good, uh, actually. It's, you know, a crypto fascist uh, kind of totalitarianism like at best. Um, you can see it very clearly even in the background of the frame here that uh, she's coming to the transport station, and the, uh, the woman at the counter says, sorry for the mess. She says, what, what, the, the huge mountains of garbage behind, <laughs> uh, behind you in the, in the transport. Is this utopia? <laughs> my, 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 term for, uh, my term for the eventual, you know, probably un unattainable target for all of this is crypto pony utopia. So here we've got uh, the ponies. Or is it something else entirely? And I figure it's probably something we don't uh, we don't really imagine yet. But we can at least think about ways to get step by step out of the mess that we're in. Stop me at any time. So, thanks. Okay. So, the history of uh, you know the use of what we call identity. Uh, we had very very simple mechanisms. It was based on personal uh, recognition. Uh, I recognize uh, Stian, I recognize Smadi, I recognize uh, 
Stefan uh, and the rest of you. I'm not sure. Oh yeah, there's Arto and uh, Lana. Okay. Um, we didn't have means of making records. Uh, no photography, uh, no writing. Uh, the best you could do would be uh, uh, chiseling things in stone or uh, making a painting on some kind of medium that was going to decay in pretty short order. Uh, other things that were used for identity included uh, branding, scarification, tattoos, even circumcision uh, as a means of tribal uh, intergroup identification. And uh, in some cultures, uh, slaves and uh, conscripts in the militaries were marked or branded in one fashion or another to uh, indicate that they either lacked or had certain privileges. And Really, the only uh, the only way to have an identity with any meaning outside of a relatively small, both in terms of number of people and geographic area, uh, would be to become uh, somebody extremely famous: a king, an emperor, a high priest, a top uh, government official, uh, a renowned artist, or something like this. In which case, they start putting up statues and uh, making uh, artwork. Uh, to memorialize your identity, uh, and in that way, your identity could actually be known uh, to many, many more people than it would have been possible. All of a sudden, writing comes along, a uh, huge leap in technology. Now we've got birth registrations, tax records, uh, the recording of uh, public deeds, uh, things like uh, letters of state passage that used to be uh, given by monarchs or you know, their officials in in Europe uh, a thousand some years ago, uh, has a very early form of passport. And then reputation, uh, again, in history was uh, pretty constricted in terms of what could be encompassed in reputation and in terms of how portable it was from place to place and from group to group. So the uh, within the tribe, uh, or within the you know the small world network, uh, reputation can be carried through uh, through an oral tradition, again through uh, through works of art commemorating people who were considerably famous, uh, and also uh, nobility in one form or another, whether it was genetic or meritocratic uh, or other types of you know elevated status for a particular caste, uh, would would carry the marks of reputation. Uh, along with them. And once again, the, uh, the development of writing brought uh, a variety of improvements on the ability to promulgate uh, and, and read uh, reputation about other people uh, in broader contexts. So we have legal records, uh, chronicles, uh, literature itself as a, as a form of arts, uh, royals, titles, charters, etc. Should be early P U P now. So early P U P really. Lex Mercatoria was a legal system that merchants uh, developed primarily in Italy and used to uh, grow trading networks, uh, first around the Mediterranean and then worldwide, uh, based on a system of private law, which essentially went to uh, keep to your contracts. If you've got a dispute with somebody, there's a process for uh, resolving the dispute, and if you're not going to play by the rules, then you will soon find that nobody will trade with you. And this enabled uh, what we can call globe spanning small world networks, where with writing, uh, people could say, uh, you know, could lend prominence to others uh, who they knew by writing and sending letters, or getting people who were able to read and write to send letters. And reputation could spread uh, outside of the geographic area, uh, both through writing and through the development of transportation. Come up to today. So today there's a whole, a whole bunch of things that go into identity. Uh, birth, marriage, death certificates, tax ID numbers, uh, national and in some cases subnational ID cards. Like in the United States, there's no national ID card except the passport, which you don't have to have. But you know, if you're asked to identify yourself, you're going to have to present a driving license or similar document. Uh, passports and travel documents, like I mentioned. Uh, I've got a thing here that looks like. Uh, looks like a passport, but actually isn't, uh, because I'm a stateless person. I'm not a citizen of any state, um, but 
I haven't quite figured out how to get along without certain things yet, so I still bow to the elder gods and <coughs> petition for their official identification documents. Uh, biometrics uh, in the form of fingerprinting, photos, etc., is now being incorporated into the ID, as you know. Uh, there's also behavioral fingerprinting that's going on at a higher level, uh, at, the, at the corporate state level, uh, that's tracking the movements of people, developing profiles of them based on who they, where they travel, who they interact with, the kind of transactions they make, and so forth. And here the parallel to the development of writing uh, back in history is, you know, oh wow, now we've got the internet. Um, so there's a whole lot more identity going on out there. Uh, worst of all is passwords, lots and lots of passwords. Uh, terrible security system, uh, widely deployed, very weak. Um, nevertheless, that's what we've got. Uh, you've got the rise, particularly in the last few years, of OAuth, which, uh, if you don't know uh, the abbreviation, it's every time you go to register for some new web service and you've got the option to sign in with Facebook or sign in with Twitter. Uh, the protocol behind that is OAuth. So you're, you're basically using uh, a Facebook or a Twitter, again, a giant, unaccountable, distant organization as your identity provider. Uh, and the, there's the emergence of identities coming out of uh, the social graph itself. But again, this is from the level of the big shadowy organizations to which that information is actually legible. Uh, the NSA, the GCHQ, the European state surveillance and transnational you know, corporations that want to turn you into the product, etc. Uh, Reputation is just all over the place. I mean, the small world networks of, uh, of ancient history still work. You've got the uh, the old boys club, which is you think it's What's that? The old boys club. The old boys club. As a term, just means uh, you know, for example, if uh, you wanted to get a job in uh, in a particular field, say that you became an expert in uh, construction and uh, in management of construction projects, and you wanted to be able to uh, to grow your business uh, in uh, Stockholm or Göteborg, um, the Old Boys Club might be a network of people who have effectively cartelized uh, the uh, the construction industry, and unless you are going to pay some kind of obedience to them. Uh, you're not going to get uh, access to the, to the lucrative contracts, you're not going to get invited to the right parties, this sort of thing. Criminal commercial registers, uh, fame moderated by a media, uh, old media like print and radio, uh, you know, new media like the internet, uh, which comes in down here. Uh, Corporate marketing as a uh, as a vehicle for reputation with a, a big R R R in there because, well, marketing is sort of like diplomacy. It's the art of selling bullshit with a smile. Uh, credit bureaus, credit rating agencies also provide reputation information uh, for people making investment decisions, lending decisions, things like that. Uh, personal data aggregator services, which are harvesting data from uh, really from all of the above and providing it to everybody from private investigators to potential employers wanting to hire you uh, to somebody maybe that you want to rent a, uh, a flat from, etc. And now again with the internet, um, you know, your reputation can turn up as elements on search engine results, uh, karma points or plus ones, etc. and uh, social forums. Going viral is just simply getting something out there that a lot of people pay attention to. You know, gets you a gold star on your on your internet reputation, whatever that's worth. Uh, I think I was in uh, I think I was in Prague last uh, last year at a pirate party convention, and somebody nudges me in the ribs and says, "Hey, Mike, do you realize you have an article about you on Wikipedia?" And I said, "What the hell?" <laughs> somebody, somebody wrote an article about me. You know, then you've got the uh, sort of the I don't know, the backwards and inside out version of uh, going viral, which is the Streisand effect, uh, which is, uh, well, it, it could be in the case like uh, Stefan comes and says, uh, oh, I don't want my photo to be taken, and uh, the person who was taking the photo is actually recording and live streaming that information. <laughs> and so the, uh, the protest 
uh, becomes a bigger story than the, uh, than the photo itself. <coughs> so, the current systems are totally full of bugs. Uh, you know, at the root of all of this identity stuff, uh, which is tied directly to reputation, uh, there's stuff like paper documents, paper birth certificates, uh, you know, your handwritten signature on a bunch of papers in a government file drawer somewhere. Um, all of that stuff uh, is weak uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, misidentification, for example, is the, uh, the SWAT team coming and raiding the wrong house, uh, shooting the dog to death and uh, terrorizing the children and then coming back several months later and saying, gee, sorry. Uh, identity theft and resource malappropriation is the ability to just exploit the weaknesses in the existing identity systems. Uh, to take certain aspects, uh, certain authenticators uh, from someone else uh, and use them to take their resources or impersonate them. Uh, more significantly, and uh, to some of the things that Vladimir was saying, we see systematic oppression growing out of the identity and reputation systems we've got today. So like you're, the very nature of who you are, uh, unless you're a philosopher, uh, is typically going to be defined in conversation with uh, the people around you as what's granted to you by hostile powers, the states, the corporations, uh, that have great interest in exercising as much control over every person as, as they can. Uh, as we see, uh, pervasive surveillance is growing. Uh, one gentleman from Germany was telling me last night about how they're just completing a uh, public surveillance camera system in Prague, uh, which includes a law that says that if you, say, put up a camera outside your business to monitor the front door for your own security, that you must also give access to the camera to the police, like, in real time. Yeah. He's the guy with the hat right behind you. <laughs> yeah. How's that for scary? Yeah. And, of course, uh, Prague, Czech Republic, that's a test market. You know, it's a small country, it's coming here, you know, it's coming there. Uh, soon it'll be everywhere. Uh, and it'll come with all kinds of nice promises of uh, improved infrastructure, better services, and more responsive, flexible democracy. Yeah. Um, you know, and then in addition to the, uh, you know, down here is this, this thing, uh, national ID cards, your papers, please. And then uh, this little, uh, I don't know, sparkle thing over there says, Sie jetzt in Arizona Papiere bitte. There's a jab at the uh, immigration controls on the uh, Mexican American border uh, in the state of Arizona. So, in addition to the, uh, you know, the papers please kind of uh, specter uh, from World War II, you've got people who are effectively non persons today by virtue of being undocumented illegal aliens in whatever country that uh, they live in or being uh, stateless persons. Uh, there's about 12, 13 million of them around the world. I'm one, but there's only one other one, I think, who's still alive that wants to be. <laughs> you know, or who that or chose to become stateless. Uh, almost all of the rest of them end up stateless because, uh, you know, a war partitions a country. Uh, you probably know about this. Uh, in uh, former Yugoslavia, there's a group called uh, the Erased. Or something like yeah, this? Yeah, there's like, yeah. I think, uh, 30,000, 32,000 people who are like erased from the database of like, yeah. Yeah. You know, because they failed to meet a deadline to register as one thing or another, uh, you know, they've effectively had no legal rights now for uh, you know, 15 years or whatever it is. Uh, <clears throat> and then also you've got things that attach to your reputation, like, uh, you know, what various states call crimes. Uh, at one time, uh, it turned into a whole bunch of nothing that's none of your damn business anyway, some period down the road. But, uh, you know, you get it today, you get uh, in the United States, for example, a felony conviction uh, for some type of uh, drugs, you know, possessing uh, you know, less than a gram of heroin. Uh, first, they send you to prison for five years, and then you've got this felony conviction that follows you around forever, which means that you can't get a decent job, you get housing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
And finally, I, I see it as a bug that managing multiple real identities uh, is, is difficult and or illegal. I mean, it doesn't really make any sense to me that I should only be allowed to have one. Uh, why shouldn't I be allowed to create my own alias for special purposes um, and go and establish business licenses, bank accounts, etc., uh, based on that? Now, in truth, I wouldn't be any good at managing multiple identities because I'm terrible at lying. Uh, no, actually, I'm very good at lying. I'm terrible at remembering which lies I've told people. Yeah, well, so in Britain, in, in the UK, you can have multiple identities, actually. Hmm. There are interesting quirks in the legal systems in different places, yes. You don't want to be a citizen in the UK with multiple identities, that's a different question. Uh -huh. But you can have multiple identities here. We'll talk later. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you add all this up, and to me at least, it looks like dystopia. And uh, the, direct, the trend uh, on all this stuff is clearly negative. Uh, it's more and more government spying. It's, you know, the corporations that we're entrusting uh, very large amounts of our data to are completely in bed uh, with the spying agencies. They're either getting paid off to do it, uh, they don't care, or uh, they're actively participating because they're just as evil. Um, corporate profiling again is, uh, you know, building a market track of all of your all of your personal data. As a lot of was talking about to uh, to turn you into the product to sell you more and more crap that you don't really need. Um, the uh, <clears throat> all of this tracking and surveillance, you know, is both happening in real time. Uh, like in the form of, if I make a telephone call and say a certain set of words, uh, an alarm is gonna go off on somebody's desk in Fort Meade, Maryland, or the GCHQ in the UK, and uh, I'll be a target for more attention. It's also retroactive now, because you know these outfits can database so much info on you that hey, even if it's encrypted, even if it's effectively unparsable or what looks like garbage today of no real interest, if you become of interest later on, they can go back and mine all of that. Uh, for anything that they want to find out uh, that you've said or done in the past. Uh, and of course, it's also predictive information. Uh, there have been a number of studies that have shown, for example, that you know, given a certain amount of uh, cell phone location data uh, from uh, you know, one, one subscriber's phone over a period of a few weeks, they can make pretty accurate predictions uh, where that person is going to be at what time at any given time. Uh, it doesn't work so well with people who travel a lot, but it does map there to a certain fuzzy degree as well. And of course, the solutions that were being offered in most cases uh, to these problems, you know, when you get, uh, when we live in a world where uh, Angela Merkel only gets excited about NSA surveillance when she learns that it was her phone being tapped too, <laughs> the solutions that are being talked about by the, uh, you know, supposedly the, uh, the leaders, it's more spying, more profiling, more biometrics, more control, more ways to be pushed out of the system and become an unperson. And, uh, you know, you want real dystopia, hey, uh, the smartphones keep getting smaller and smarter, uh, the biotech is getting better and better. One of these days, you're going to get an offer from a TCOM or a Telia or AT&T, and they're going to say, hey, we've got the implant now with the bone conduction microphone and the retinal implant, and we're going to give it to you free. <laughs> Lifetime, free. And of course, that's going to be a big, uh, a big data sink. Uh, we're going to pour, what? Google Glass. Google Glass, Google Glass as, as, as one potential example, yeah. And, uh, and that's real tricky, too, because uh, you know, it's been shown that, <clears throat> it's been shown that a certain amount of psychological behavioral conditioning can be done uh, by forcing people to watch uh, images uh, displayed at, uh, you know, kind of subliminal speed. Well, when you've got access that close to the retina of somebody who's, you know, on Google Glass or whatever the next generation has a, has a retinal implant or a, an ocular implant all day long, reality might start looking very, very strange. To me, I figure most people, including you, already have these implants. So you don't know about it yet, but there's a lot of freaking weird people in this world. <laughs> so the future is up to us. Um, I, the, the title of this thing was called uh, the Four Pillars. Uh, if I 
if I managed to get uh, all the crypto pony cyber on the uh, on the title, maybe there'd be more people in the room. But uh, I'm, I'm I'm very satisfied. Uh, so the four pillars of uh, Cypherpunk Utopia, as I define them, are secure communications, anonymous and pseudonymous communications, a digital bearer currency, which means uh, a currency that works uh, just like cash, you hand it from one person to another, you don't need any third party's approval uh, to transfer it from one person to another, and you can't take it back from the other person at all uh, without their consent. In the case of physical cash, actually, you can use violence to take it back. Um, but in the case of a, uh, a true digital bearer currency, like Bitcoin, uh, you absolutely need their consent to take it back. And this fourth pillar, uh, the one that I'm here to talk about now after blowing 35 minutes, is uh, peer to peer identity and uh, reputation management. So just to run through the pillars, so secure communication, we've already got it. Um, what? Go back. Oh. Crypto pony? No, uh, I was waiting for a couple of words. Oh, you, you can have a conference for it. Special price for you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, there are, there are problems, but uh, in the form of uh, asymmetric uh, public key crypt cryptography like PGP, uh, and in uh, Symmetric key cryptography backed up with um, asymmetric key crypto certificate and verification mechanisms. Uh, we've got secure communications. But that has its doubts. That's fine. Uh, but there are big issues. Uh, the PGP web of trust model uh, isn't really working uh, on, on anything like the scale uh, that the original cypherpunks imagined when uh, you know Zimmerman first got uh, PGP out there into the wild. Uh, we're seeing governments and other actors compromising uh, HTTPS certificate authorities. Um, and of course, the implementations uh, of protocols and of uh, crypto systems uh, can be weak, can be flawed, can be deliberately backdoored by hostile powers and so on. And finally, uh, the deployment uh, of secure communications is very, very low uh, because the user friendliness of programs like PGP uh, particularly has not really followed anything like the curves of improvement uh, and evolution that some other technologies have. And I think that has to do simply with the fact that it's hard. Um, it, you know, it's not a trivial thing to practice good operational security in terms of your communication. So the, uh, the software and the interfaces uh, suffer, which pushes users away rather than attracting them. In anonymous communications, we've got, we've got some pretty good solutions there, or at least models uh, of solutions uh, in the form of Tor, uh, ITP, the Digital Internet Project, uh, and others like uh, recently BitMessage, which is uh, something derived from uh, an aspect of Bitcoin, uh, the cryptographic hash blockchain uh, mechanism for propagating network history. But again, problems. Uh, these are Evolving technologies, uh, you know, Tor is only just over a decade old. I IP is younger, it messages a year or so. Uh, there's a very small number of experts in the field. Um, and again, as before, uh, if the uh, if the theory is great that the implementation is uh, is poor, uh, or if the uh, the implementation is great but the usability uh, is such that only the most dedicated geeks can do it. These technologies don't mean very much in practical terms. Finally, uh, not finally, and ultimately, uh, digital bearer currency. Uh, we finally got that, I believe, in the form of Bitcoin and other blockchain cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. Uh, it was a very difficult problem. Lots and lots of different pieces uh, of what became Bitcoin were developed and uh, elaborated uh, over the years since. 1996 or so when I first started reading about this um, and for a long time it was a real head scratcher you know like what the hell is ever going to solve this set of problems and from what I've seen uh, this seems to work it may not be perfect uh, a lot of people aren't persuaded you know, are we, is it too early to be sure probably 
but we've at least got a good model now where we had nothing effective before. Again, it's a new evolving technology, small number of experts. Implementation, is it really being done properly? Probably we can't tell. And uh, you know, usability for, for anything really new that isn't uh, marketing driven uh, with Bitcoin isn't, uh, is going to be a challenge. One more terrible thing about this is this is really a challenge for really large scale adoption experience. And of course, different people see parents differently. Mm -hmm. But by like, Bitcoin, okay, you are early in, you get very rich, and you are not going to lose that position. So, yeah. and so you have yeah. to. Should I still enter the pirate scheme or will I be at the bottom? Which one? Is it, is it can I still join this pirate scheme or will I be at the bottom? <laughs> the pirate scheme, the pyramid scheme yeah. Yeah, that's true. You know, the, the early uh, the early adopters uh, obtain significant uh, financial advantage, uh, and that's for some of them also translated into a significant advantage, advantage in potential attacks against the network uh, because of the power in terms of the compute power used to uh, mine bitcoins if they wanted to get together and try to. Yeah, but I mean also physical power in the world. Mm -hmm. In the world, to convert to bitcoin, you have a lot of bitcoins and a lot of power over all kinds of. Uh, yes, although what Bitcoin does is it breaks the connection that says, uh, you know, today it's he who has the gold makes the rules, right? Yeah. Um, and the way that that's being done is by controlling money itself uh, as a construct. Uh, Bitcoin puts the control aspect in the hands of mathematics. Uh, there's effectively nobody who can grab hold of the mathematics that go into Bitcoin and say, we're going to manipulate this for purposes of political domination. Uh, and, that's, and that's a change. Of course, whoever is wealthier uh, is going to have more of an influence, which does translate into real power. I mean, let's say some country like Ethiopia, now countries that are like world progress to Bitcoin, and Ethiopian people start going Bitcoin, and then they say, one person in the United States who has more wealth and all the Ethiopians and the Ethiopian government combined, so that, that person can kind of basically buy anyone from there to move on that position. <laughs> Running out of time, I yeah, have to run through the next two slides real quick. I'm sorry. But yes, there are economics stuff that needs to be talked about. Um, finally, P2P ID and uh, reputation. Uh, this is the, the missing piece, the fourth pillar, what we need. Why is to fix the existing bugs to enable a, a freer, more resilient, more just, uh, more fluid society. Uh, in, my, in my way of thinking, uh, states, nations, citizenships, and whatever are relics of a rather cruel past uh, and don't have a role in our future. Uh, if we're going to have uh, a working system for this, it's going to have to be based on some principles, some ideals, um, and we're going to have to do it, um, or else it's going to be something that's done to us, where we're turned into the product in the course of it. So I could just put down here a few as you know, self-determination, autonomy, privacy as the default position, decentralization as opposed to centralization, wherever possible, uh, and, and resilience. Uh, I'm sure you can think of other things that would go into uh, you know, your, your wish list. Uh, for principles that should be observed in uh, identity and reputation systems. As far as the toolkit that we have out there to do the implementations, there's already lots and lots of free software. Uh, there's research papers on, on lots of different aspects uh, of the field. I mean, I'm not an expert in this field myself. I just looked at the program for the conference and the, uh, the title of the track and it said, hmm, yeah, I can do it with this. So we've got strong cryptography out there. Again, qualified by the implementation and usability issues, the anonymity networks, newly emerging digital bearer currencies, uh, manifesting in things like HTTPS and OAuth, uh, distributed hash tables, uh, graph databases, which are becoming more and more popular for representing uh, social connection information, being able to do things uh, you know, across a map rather than uh, drilling down into tables and summing into rows. Uh, QRs, QR codes and barcodes, I mean, <coughs> even the technology used to produce, you know, what to me is a hated ID card, uh, 
Uh, it is actually good technology for producing uh, secure authentication offline tokens that can be used uh, you know, out there where there's no internet. But what's the point of all of this? Um, you know, what, what does having these kind of systems enable? Um, no particular order. I've, I've got an idea that I think about from time to time on the toilet and in the shower called Reptcoin, which is uh, a reputational uh, cryptocurrency. Where would this come from? Uh, maybe, for example, uh, everybody on the planet at the time that they were born would start getting issued uh, by the network uh, 10,000 rep coins per day. Uh, rep coins would expire after a certain period of time if you didn't spend them. They would expire if you didn't uh, send them to somebody else. Uh, obtaining rep coin wealth would be, uh, maintaining it would be very difficult. Uh, but this would be a, a way to uh, put social pluses and minuses against people, uh, and then being able to look out to somebody in your network who's you know, three hops away from you removed and say, okay, how well is this person actually trusted uh, in certain fields and certain spheres? Uh, likewise, you could do perhaps an identity system uh, on a blockchain uh, type, uh, type infrastructure. Uh, Go forth yourself is, uh, is about having multiple identities, um, or even creating a new identity uh, from the ground up. This could be, you know, for whatever reason. It could be, you know, because you're a, a terrorist, uh, or it could be because, uh, for example, you were the victim of rape uh, at some period of time, which was widely publicized, and uh, you wanted to go somewhere else and start a new life without any connection uh, to your previous identity. Uh, current legal systems don't permit that. Reputation across the social graph I mentioned. Uh, doing things like uh, incorporating legal entities like corporations, clubs, nonprofits, uh, actually in cyberspace uh, with self enforcing mechanisms based on mathematics, not on co very corruptible law and law officers. Uh, non monopoly systems for arbitration and justice, uh, putting many lawyers out of business. Hooray! Um, but with apologies to your friend. Uh, peer to peer models for doing uh, insurance, bonding, and even uh, property ownership and transfer. Um, through something like RepCoin, we, we can actually provide very strong disincentives for bad behavior where people within the society close to the bad actor observes uh, the bad action and they send or take away rep coins from, from somebody to indicate that they've lost trust uh, or that they've you know, really observed something awful. Uh, could this become uh, something that leads to a universal basic income uh, on, the, on the socialist kind of thinking end of things, or perhaps being able to divide uh, your own self up into a million shares and do an IPO on the, uh, on the blockchain stock market? I don't know, um, but here we go. That's it. <laughs>